Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Ulrich Wilmes. I'm chief curator at Haus der Kunst and as Okwi said, somehow involved in both the exhibitions that we open today. Uh, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce to you the speakers of our first chapter of the symposium, the first day of our symposium, Professor Michael Dears and Professor W. J. T. Mitchell, who will give us a statement first and then start a discussion on uh, the pictures as sites of theoretical discourse. Let me briefly introduce to you both speakers, though I trust that it's actually probably not necessary to do so. Michael Dears, born in 1950, is one of the leading art historians in Germany. His main areas of research are widespread in the field of history, theory, and aesthetics of art. His main fields are Renaissance, modern, and contemporary art, and specially focus on the notion of political iconography. Michael Dears studied art history, German, and philosophy in Münster and Hamburg, and earned his doctorate on a on a study on Abby Warburg. He was scientific assistant with Martin Warnke on the uh, project, on the research project of political iconography in Essen, was assistant professor in art history at the University of Hamburg and associate professor at the Art Historical Institute of the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena before he became associate professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin. His, today, since 2004, he is professor for uh, art history and image history at the Hochschule für Bildende Kunst in Hamburg. His teaching and his research is he put under a very specific motto, so to say, which he, which he took from a, video, uh, from a neon work by Maurizio Nanucci, which says, all art has been contemporary. So Michael Dears will give us a statement on the photograph of the Situation Room in Washington, D.C. on May second, 2011, one of the most spread and most discussed photographs of our times. Before that, Professor W. J. T. Mitchell from the University of Chicago will give us his statement on on the development of the use of images after 9-11. Professor Mitchell, born in 1942, is one of the leading theorists of media, visual art, and literature. He has had a profound influence in important areas of 20th century American critical thought. On the one hand, he has done much to enable the development of theory in culture criticism. On the other, he is one of the most persistent liter literary scholars to comment on the emerging field of study identified with visual culture. His monographs, Iconology from 1986 and Picture Theory from 1994, are among the most influential contributions on media theory. Mitchell has consistently played the skeptic's role, championing the irreducible power of images and remaining every worry 
of the potential of academic culture theory to explain images with words. His work further focuses on the relations of visual and verbal representation in the context of social and political issues. His collection of essays, What Do Pictures Want?, won the important James Russell Lowell Prize of the Modern Language Association in 2005. His ongoing efforts are committed to the rethinking of visual culture as a form of life and in light of digital media. His latest book, Cloning for Terror, The War of Images, 9-11 to the Present, was among the most important sources for our research on the exhibition Image Counter Image. W.J. T. Mitchell is the Gaylord Donnelly Distinguished Service Professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago. He's also the editor of the interdisciplinary quarterly journal Critical Inquiry and a frequent contributor to the journal October. In his statement, he will cross-reference and discuss the thesis of his latest book, Cloning on Terror, uh, and afterwards discuss his thesis with those of Michael Diaz. Professor Diaz, Professor Mitchell, a warm welcome to Munich. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrich, and, and thank you, Okui, for the invitation to uh, uh, speak at this conference. Uh, it's a marvelous exhibition. I hope uh, all of you will go and see it. It, uh, it really, I think, uh, introduces something new into the reflections on images and war, images at war. Um, this session uh, was billed as one on methodology. And of course, immediately I began to um, have a panic attack uh, because uh, methodology is something I've always been against. I'm a, uh, a student of the great historian of science, uh, Paul Feyerabend, who wrote the, the classic Against Method. Uh, that, uh, uh, methods, the best thing that you can say for a method is, is that it is foolproof, uh, which means that any fool can do it. Uh, so, uh, but I may have to change my view as a result of this symposium because it occurred to me that this brilliant conception, uh, build, gegen build, image, counter image, actually contains within it uh, my own sense of method uh, in the study of images. And briefly, uh, here would be the, the thesis. Uh, every image has a counter image. Every image is a counter image. And every image creates a counter image. In other words, every image has a past, a present, and a future. Uh, an image that it comes from, uh, that it is in the present, and that it produces or reproduces in a f some future that it opens. Uh, so if I have a method, it is not only to look at the image, but look for the counter image. Uh, and that's what I try to do in this book. I uh, uh, hope you don't mind my waving it in front of you. Cloning Terror, but it is in German now from Zurkamp. Uh, a, a very excellent translation, I think. And uh, uh, the, the idea of bringing together the war on terror with the discourse on cloning was, in a sense, already uh, an attempt to uh, pair up two images that seem completely in different worlds from one another. Uh, and I've illustrated them by uh, this image and counter image. The very familiar image of the onset of the war on terror, 9-11, the destruction of the World Trade Center, paired with uh, this harmless, innocuous image of a sheep, Dolly the sheep, the first clone. What does this image counter image pairing uh, show us? Uh, I want to argue that Dolly uh, exemplifies uh, the revolution in image technology 
that has occurred in our time. Uh, similar to Walter Benjamin's uh, argument that images in the age of mechanical reproduction underwent a mutation, uh, my argument is that in our time, images have undergone a double technical revolution. On the one side, uh, the familiar digital revolution represented here by the Turing machine, uh, the beginning of the reduction of the analog representation, the image, to a series of ones and zeros, to a binary code. And on the other, uh, perhaps a less uh, publicized notion of a revolution of images, and that's uh, the discovery of the secret of life, uh, the invention by biotechnology of the possibility of making living copies of living organisms. Uh, in other words, living images of living images. Uh, th th this revolution, which I call biocybernetics, simply to, to link together biology on the one hand and information science on the other, I think has to be understood as the technical framework of image production and circulation in our time. Images are cloned endlessly, and uh, life forms, uh, likewise. A, a process which realizes, uh, in uh, technical terms, uh, an imaginary conception, a dream conception which has been with humanity since the beginning, since the first creation of human beings, as the Bible tells us, in the image of their creator. Uh, so Dali is a picture uh, of the production, the creation uh, of, an, of an image, a whole series of counter images that depend on an original donor. Uh, what about the World Trade Center? What kind of image is it? Uh, well, of course, it was a cultural and some political icon well before it was destroyed. The World Trade Center attack in 9-11 was not the first attempt to destroy it. Uh, so equally important to the life of images in our time is uh, the attempt to destroy images. Uh, again, an ancient practice, iconoclasm, is uh, one of those practices that goes back to the very creation of, of images. If God creates man in his image, the next thing he does is to pass a law telling uh, human beings that they must not create images, that that's reserved for God. Uh, that's what the second commandment uh, basically has to say. Uh, the most fervent followers of the Second Commandment in our time, uh, of course, are the Taliban. And one thing the Taliban showed to us, uh, as if we needed reminding, uh, was that the destruction of an image, the erasure of it, the exploding and melting down of it, uh, is also the production of an image. Now here is a uh, young Taliban warrior proudly showing uh, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas uh, rendered as calendar art. Uh, I use the word art advisedly here. Uh, so the World Trade Center, uh, the, the image of Dali, uh, I think signify in our time both the production and the destruction of images with the understanding that the destruction of images is also, can be a productive process. Uh, iconoclasm is not just about destroying things but about producing an image of destruction uh, as an ominous warning to those who care about that image. The, the, those two images uh, also signify for me two sort of temporalities of uh, the history of images in our time. I would call, uh, call them the Foucauldian and the Sartrean uh, models of history. Uh, history as uh, systems of epistemes, structures, uh, cognitive styles, uh, represented by Dali as an emblem of biopower and biopolitics. The World Trade Center as an emblem of Sartrean history, that is the history of contingency, accident, the unforeseen, uh, the thing that comes like a bolt out of the blue. And my book is an effort actually to reconcile the oil and water uh, of Foucault and Sartre as, uh, as guides to thinking the temporality of uh, historical images. But as long as I'm talking about method, I want to 
uh, go back to what's pro probably one of the foundational moments in the, the whole theme of images and counter images. Certainly, it would be found in the world of caricature. This is Art Spiegelman's uh, drawing of his drawing desk in which he is uh, exercising his imagination uh, with the various caricatures of ethnic stereotypes uh, and gender stereotypes as well. The, the uh, stereotypes, of course, are drawn in ink, but the drawing bo board, the drawing table, is spattered with blood. Uh, Spiegelman, in other words, seeing that the, the, the image generates a counter image which might have something to do with the destruction of the, the people, uh, the killing of the people represented by those images or the reduction of them uh, to bare life. Uh, so images, uh, as we know, uh, are, are constantly uh, open to the possibility of being used as weapons, uh, and, and, and as aggressive, hostile expressions of hate, disgust, and violence, and also as targets of violence. Uh, the destruction of the World Trade Center treated that, uh, that icon as a target. Uh, there is another, and let's say more uh, pacifist and uh, ethereal uh, version of the image that uh, I like to associate with the great American cartoonist Saul Steinberg, this is his, uh, I think of this as his answer to Heidegger's uh, Age of the World Picture. It's called New World. And uh, it shows us that the world itself can be pictured, not just uh, individual things within it, uh, but the world might be produced as a picture, uh, a counter image to a reality uh, that either comes out of that picture or uh, comes into it from outside. Uh, the, the direction of the drawing, of course, suggests that in this case, the world comes from the act of drawing. Uh, Steinberg also reflected, uh, and I think remarkably uh, prescient philosophical ways on the, the question of the subject, the spectator himself, here showing the hidden subject inside the man as a scared rabbit looking out through the, uh, the eyes. Spiegelman, uh, to me, one of the greatest comic artists of our time, uh, portrays himself as poised uh, as a tightrope walker uh, in between two posts, uh, signified by Steinberg on the one hand, the, the intellectual cartoonist, and Robert Crumb on the other, the cartoonist of the body, of the vulgar, uh, of thick thighs and keep on trucking. Uh, so, and I think this is a very accurate self-portrait showing uh, that images not only come to us as representations of things, but as exemplifications of styles. So, uh, Spiegelman re rendering himself as trying to walk the line uh, between two contrary styles, one highly physical, uh, one highly intellectual. Uh, that's why, as you notice, in a kind of Steinbergian flourish, the, the end of the tightrope on one end uh, does not connect. It spirals up into the air, untethered. So, let, let me now turn back to the question of war and the image and the counter-image. This, of course, this perhaps the most famous image to come out of the Vietnam War, uh, was in itself, in its moment, uh, a counter image of what it was supposed to represent, which was a war for, against communist tyranny, a war to liberate Vietnam uh, uh, from its uh, northern aggressor. Uh, th this being one moment in that war when, uh, as General Westmoreland put it, we had to destroy a village in order to save it. Uh, th this image, of course, became central uh, to the increasing American disgust with that war, a disgust which unfortunately took several years to mature uh, and a, a presidential election uh, before the war could actually end, before it could actually, the U.S. could actually uh, almost admit defeat. Uh, and that war, that, that war's images 
cast their shadow over a future uh, to come, as uh, the, the car cartoonist Dennis Grogan uh, reveals in this uh, remarkable composition, which he calls Abu Nam, uh, as if the uh, napalm victim of Vietnam is echoed in the torture victim, uh, this famous icon uh, from the invasion of Iraq, from Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, uh, it, an image which became central, as I'll show, to the unfolding of a whole set of successive counter images. Uh, and you must regard these as a, the tip uh, of the archive or uh, the, the, the tip of the iceberg, uh, because thousands, literally thousands, of different renderings and mutations and adaptations of this image uh, have appeared. One distinction that I like to make, and perhaps this might be added to the counter image, counter image uh, dialectic, is the distinction between an image and a picture. Uh, I know this is difficult to translate into German, which uh, uh, has the one word build for both images and pictures. In English, there is a vernacular connotation that a picture is a unique singular object, it's materialized. You can hang a picture. Whereas the image is something that appears in the picture, uh, something that could be copied from the picture, remembered, uh, transmitted into a, a different medium. So you might take this uh, pairing of this image and its counter image uh, as an exemplar of exactly that process, that distinction. The, the unique singular image uh, digital, of course, uh, we, we, we know what camera took it, we know exactly what time of day and where, uh, but the original image of the Abu Ghraib man uh, remains there as, in my view, an exemplar of the picture uh, in its material specifiability. Uh, the, the cartoonist David Rees uh, then uh, produces uh, an image of mutation and transformation, quite literally turning the Abu Ghraib man into bionic Abu Ghraib man, a transformer uh, who uh, can transform himself into, from an image of weakness and abjection into an image of power and violence. Uh, that is, quite literally, like the film Transformers, he becomes a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, and a weapon of mass destruction that is aimed at the destruction of other images. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the famous uh, faces of the presidents, uh, uh, Roosevelt, Jefferson, uh, Washington, at Mount Rushmore. Uh, you'll notice also that the presidents, sensing the approach of the bionic Abu Ghraib man, uh, are alarmed. Uh, Washington is crying out, what is that thing? And Jefferson, uh, uh, says, I don't know, but it's headed right at us. Washington then asks, literally or metaphorically, I can't turn my head. <laughs> and this, by the way, is one of the things that I think w the image, counter image uh, problematic needs to take account of. That is, the whole concept of the war on terror w began as a, a rhetorical trope, as a metaphor. Uh, like the war on tuberculosis, the war on poverty, uh, it was a metaphor for maximum effort. We will do our best, uh, our utmost, to stamp out terrorism. But the idea that it would become literally a war in which we would invade countries in order to defeat terrorism, uh, that we would bomb civilian populations in, in order to take out bad guys, this was the literalization of that metaphor. It's as if when Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty, uh, he said, and the way to conduct this is, of course, to bomb poor neighborhoods. Uh, it would have had the same kind of logic. So one way the image counter image works is to take an image which is imaginary, speculative, merely metaphorical, and to make it real. Or even more emphatically, to take a lie, a fiction, and to make it true by repetition, which is what happened with the war on terror. Uh, uh, proliferating images of terrorists everywhere. This basic trope of the, uh, the replicated or cloned image uh, 
uh, as you know, went viral uh, uh, all over the world, not just the West, uh, but uh, with the help of Al Jazeera and other media outlets, it became uh, a duplicable image here shown in a chorus line uh, on a website uh, in 2004, and uh, shown as well in a wonderful piece of culture jamming where it begins to merge with the advertisements for the iPod, uh, and an image uh, of juxtaposition, of pairing with a counter image that uh, could easily, um, well, can be read in many different ways. I'm not gonna pause to, uh, to meditate on it very long. Many people saw that lower image of uh, the Abu Ghraib man inserted among the uh, iPod dancers as a sign of the weakness of the image and its absorption into the image flow of mass culture. Uh, at the same time, you could read it in just the opposite way, as a kind of subliminal advertising, uh, the kind of thing you see out of the corner of your eye uh, that may affect uh, at the level of the unconscious. There was also a, a wonderful moment in uh, the summer of 2004, immediately after the Abu Ghraib photographs uh, were entered in. This image appears in the exhibition, uh, not, of course, the original, the wall mural in Baghdad, uh, but the pairing of uh, the Statue of Liberty with the Abu Ghraib man. Uh, this pairing inside Iraq uh, fused itself. The image and the counter image fused themselves into a single metaphor so that when people would talk about the Abu Ghraib man, the hooded man, uh, they would refer to it as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you can see here the Statue of Liberty has been slightly modified to match it up. The pedestal uh, is uh, comparable. Uh, the, the robe is white instead of black, and the hood has eyes in it, signifying uh, the kind of racial uh, uh, hatred that uh, we have to admit uh, was operational uh, throughout uh, the invasion of Iraq. Uh, the idea that we were rescuing brown people from their own uh, illegitimate rulers. Uh, the connection of the Abu Ghraib man with the figure of the clone uh, becomes, I think, uh, almost literal and explicit in this remarkable work by Paul McCarthy at the Hamburger Bahnhof. Uh, it is literally the clone, and it, you can see uh, the, the basic idea of it is the reduction of the human form to bear life. Uh, clones are notoriously uh, the, the objects of organ donation, the, uh, the idea that we would make copies of ourselves so that we would have spare parts like livers, kidneys, hearts, and so forth that would not be rejected by our immune system is uh, fundamental to uh, the kind of science fiction fantasies about what the future of this image technology might be. And uh, McCarthy has rendered that by suggesting that the arms have already been harvested uh, from this particular clone. And the, the image of the hood uh, in our time uh, I think has become one of the most powerful uh, uh, counter images, producing a whole set of uh, replicas and reflections, artistic reflections on what it means to uh, put a hood over someone, over the human face, to erase the face, uh, to, to make someone anonymous, uh, to render them unidentifiable. Uh, one of the, uh, the most profound meditations on this, I think, is uh, by Hans Hacke, who is here with us. Uh, it, it is called Stargazing. Uh, and this is a, a remarkable mutation of the hooded man motif, which uh, takes the hooded man as uh, self-hoodwinked. We use the, uh, the English vernacular hoodwinked when uh, someone deceives themselves. This um, uh, star-studded bag over the head uh, Haka produced just before the 2004 election as a kind of uh, ominous and prophetic sign of what the American public was doing to itself. Putting a bag over your head in the United States 
is usually done at sports uh, events when you have a team that is losing uh, and, and it's an expression of shame. You don't want to be known as a, a fan of the Chicago Cubs. Uh, so you go to the game wearing a hood so you'll be anonymous. Uh, in this case, of course, you can't even watch the game. All you can do is uh, uh, perhaps see a little bit of light coming through those stars. Uh, of course, as always, the New Yorker and its covers are the place where uh, iconic moments uh, emerge. And it wouldn't be a story about the war if I didn't say something about the end of the war. Uh, if I really had time, I would talk about Colin Powell's uh, image of the phantom truck that was transformed at the last documenta uh, by Inigo Manglanovale into an actual sculptural phantom truck. This was the truck that was supposed to contain the mobile chemical weapons laboratory, uh, which was the evidence for the United Nations that the Iraqis indeed did have weapons of mass destruction. It turned out to be a complete lie, fabrication, but an incredibly powerful image nevertheless. So, if, but I'm not going to show you that. I assume you all remember what the phantom truck looked like. Uh, it looked like nothing except a, a truck for launching weather balloons, as it happens. But the, uh, the moment of the end of the war began to be signaled uh, in 2008. Uh, and I use the word end in quotation marks because, of course, the war is not over, uh, even in Iraq, certainly not in Afghanistan. And uh, there are a lot of people who would like to see it go to Iran. Uh, as Donald Rumsfeld once said, real men want to go to Iran. Uh, but the, the, the harbinger of a different kind of image uh, emerged in the summer of 2008, uh, when a kind of miraculous, uh, and, and I, I, I still sometimes have to pinch myself to uh, uh, remind myself that this actually happened, that a black man with a Muslim name uh, was elected president of the United States. Of course, uh, I could go on and on with the counter images to uh, the real Barack Obama, that you remember the Obama of Shepard Ferry's poster with hope and change associated with it. Uh, but of course, right alongside that was the counter image of Obama as a Muslim, uh, an illegal immigrant, actually born in Kenya, uh, the, the, the current candidate for the presidency on the Republican side, continues to uh, circulate and uh, uh, support this, uh, this ridiculous uh, fable. Uh, with Michelle Obama, of course, as a uh, 1968 uh, Angela Davis revolutionary, uh, burning the American flag in the white in the Oval Office's fireplace, and with uh, a portrait, not of George Washington, but of uh, Osama bin Laden over the fireplace. So how, given this, how could Obama be elected? Uh, I mean, I could show you many more. It, there was a tsunami of counter images of Obama. And I can only uh, attribute it to what I would call a fit of temporary sanity. Uh, a moment when, and a kind of perverse sanity in which the American people voted into the, the presidency a man whose name, at the level of the acoustic image, was a synthesis of the great enemies of the United States during the previous era. It was as if the American people had elected Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden as President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. Once you start playing with the sound images of those names, it becomes very difficult to disentangle image and counter image. There was also a way in which, in the background of the War on Terror, the image uh, of the terrorist, the image of the torture victim, was merging with the image of Christian sovereignty, as if perhaps the terrorist is not merely a criminal, the terrorist is, uh, by definition, the enemy of the sovereign. Therefore, the double, the mirror, the counter-sovereign. Uh, image again, and counter-image. And it's most profoundly captured, I think, in this 
uh, montage from the Chicago Tribune in 2004, uh, which illustrated the very first thing I ever wrote about this, uh, th this whole matter. Uh, this also is the tip of an iceberg. We could go on to pictures of the Christian sovereign, uh, the entire history of images of Western sovereignty from uh, Moses uh, in mosaics in Rome, Moses at the Battle of the Amalekites, all the way down to Hobbes Leviathan, uh, all of them with their arms outstretched in the symbol uh, of power. There was also a curious doubling of this sort in which uh, the, the recruiting of American uh, soldiers uh, was curiously being redoubled by Osama bin Laden himself. I call this uh, image, counter image uh, complex, Uncle Osama, uh, to indicate what was actually quite a real strategy because uh, as Richard Clark, head of counterintelligence uh, under four U.S. presidencies put it, this was uh, Osama bin Laden's explicit plan. The idea was to attack the World Trade Center, not because that would produce a military victory, but as a provocation that would lure the U.S. into invading and occupying Iraq. Uh, so this image, in a way, although totally fictional, also tells an, a very profound truth. And then finally, to come back to Obama, what happens when Barack Hussein Obama, whose name resonates with those of the enemies of the U.S., becomes president of the United States? And, and uh, what happens especially at the moment uh, when another kind of symbolic image appears, that, that is the death of Osama bin Laden? Uh, this will lead into Michael Dyer's uh, uh, presentation on the Situation Room. But before the Situation Room photograph was released, the news captured uh, this, uh, this event. Fox News, for instance, uh, reported that Obama bin Laden uh, was dead. Uh, it was what we call a, a Lacanian slip. The, uh, a typographical error. It was quickly corrected, but fortunately I was able to uh, uh, snatch it off the screen before Fox News uh, tried to put it, flush it down the memory hole. But even more remarkable is, uh, again, the confusion of the oral image with the counter image uh, in the following report from Canadian World News. And to follow this image, you again have to listen quite carefully. More being heard about how Obama was killed and what led to the American forces finding out where he was. It started when Obama took office. He directed the head of the CIA to make killing Obama their number one priority. Back in August, they got a possible lead on where Obama might be hiding. He was located, possibly, they believed at that time, in a compound deep within Pakistan. And now, this is uh, extremely funny in my view, but it's also uh, like uh, the Freudian slip and the Lacanian slip, it's an expression of a wish. Uh, if, uh, if I had time, I would show you the repertoire of uh, imagistic calls for the assassination of Barack Obama. Some people are very worried that he might not be reelected, uh, but there's also a worry that he might be assassinated between now and December. Certainly the threats are more than any president's ever had. This brings me to my final image, uh, the Situation Room, uh, which also I think has an ominous counter image. Of course it has the implied absent image, the vanished image of uh, the, the dead Osama bin Laden, perhaps at the moment uh, of his murder. Uh, the New Yorker later produced a cover uh, entitled Rubbed Out, uh, which showed the erasure of Osama bin Laden's face. Paradoxically, at the very moment uh, of the erasure from the, this image uh, of what the people in the Situation Room are watching, 
bin Laden's image was proliferated all over the world. Uh, it hadn't been on the news that much, but it appeared and reappeared. Uh, so my family and I created a counter image to this image uh, last Christmas, which I'm going to conclude with. Uh, this is the Christmas card we sent out uh, and in which um, th this event, I have to tell you that the Obamas uh, actually are neighbors of ours in Hyde Park in Chicago. He, t he taught in the law school at University of Chicago and we actually some six years ago did spend a Christmas Eve with them uh, and a lot of other neighbors. One of these, uh, Hyde Park is a very sociable place. So the following scene is not completely implausible, just a little bit implausible. I hope that counter image will speak for itself. Thanks very much.